Perfect. All righty, so let's get started. Hello and welcome to today's session. My name is Madison and I am a marketing coordinator for our Master of Science in Learning Design and Technology online degree program. Thank you so much for joining us for today's expert series webinar, Designing Stories into E-Learning with faculty member and DevLearn 2022 conference speaker, Hadia Nuruddin. A couple of housekeeping notes before we get started. Our program academic director, Lisa Evans, has joined us for this session and will be monitoring the chat to help answer any program specific questions that you may have. This session will be recorded and you can expect an email to be sent your way with that recording by the end of the day today. This platform also uses a chat feature that you will be able to see on the right hand side of your screen. So please feel free to jump in and say hello and use this feature if you have any questions during or throughout the session. We will have time at the end for questions, but we will also be monitoring the chat throughout. And at the end of this webinar, we will be sharing important program information, such as program details and application and admissions information. So let's get started. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing you to our featured speaker, Hadia Nuruddin. Hadia has over 20 years of experience in learning and development, where she specializes in instructional design and development for corporate, nonprofit, and academic environments. She has extensive experience in designing, developing, and delivering both technical and professional development courses using a variety of industry tools and technologies. In addition to her instructional design experience, she is also the author of Story Training, Selecting and Shaping Stories That Connect, and she's contributed to many Association for Talent Development publications. And with that, I will be passing the presentation controls over to Hadia until the end of the presentation. Take it away. Thank you so much. Such an honor to be here. Super excited about it. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so as mentioned, the name of my session is Designing Stories into E-Learning. Um, as mentioned as well, I've been in learning development for quite some time as a facilitator, a functional designer, e-learning developer. Um, and I got interested in storytelling mostly as an offshoot of my um, writing experience. Um, but also because of film and because of I'm a big film buff and, and all of that. So I've always been interested in it. Um, I would say that one thing that really sparked my interest in um, storytelling and learning was when I got my uh, master's in uh, writing, which is something that I wouldn't recommend people go spend a fortune on a master's degree in writing. However, um, investing in my writing career definitely made me a far better instructional designer. And I think one of the reasons why is because it forced me more so, more than I was already doing, to look at the world through someone else's eyes. And because um, as a writer, oftentimes that's what you're doing. You're telling somebody else's story, characters that you made up. And um, in many ways, that's what we're doing as instructional designers. So that really, really helped me um, review my work a little bit differently and get more engaged and invested in the art of storytelling when it comes to learning and support. Um, I thought that when I wrote the book Story Training that there were probably already 100,000 books out there already about storytelling and learning and that convergence there. Um, but I soon found, soon found out that there are very few, if any, there's one other person who wrote a book after me named Rance Green, whose books focuses more on development, um, instructional design and storytelling. My book focuses more on uh, facilitation and storytelling, but I was able to take that and draw some conclusions about learn about storytelling and apply that to what we do. Um, so I'm excited to be in this space. I'm able to, you know, take storytelling and apply it to all the work that um, instructional designers do. And today in particular is just one of those areas, which is actually designing e-learning and making sure that you can incorporate storytelling in some way. All right. So what I would like to do is in the chat, give me a rating of how comfortable you are using stories and e-learning if you do it. If you don't do it, that's okay. Um, imagine you are doing it and how comfortable you would feel. One is, oh, I don't think so. And five is, are you kidding me? I'm like a screenwriter. I'm the best. So give me an indication one through five in the chat. What do you think? I see someone in the chat from Chicago. I'm calling from Chicago as well. Uh, 
let's see here. What do we got here? Trying to go down here. Oh, okay. So this chat goes from the top. All right. <laughs> it's a little different than what I'm used to. There we go. Now I see something here. All right. So yeah, three is a common one. We got some. It's a it's a one here. Haven't had the opportunity. That's fine. It's interesting with stories, though, you know, I, I'm sure if I sat you down and said, tell me a story, many of us do that very, very well. But I think it's something about formalizing it in some capacity and building learning around it that can be a challenge sometimes. A lot of times when you are working in the field, your clients and the subject matter experts and stakeholders are resistant to the idea of stories. And I think it's because, um, well, I don't think, I know it's because a lot of times they don't feel like storytelling will be taken seriously. I think they're thinking about princesses and dragons and things of that sort. Um, and honestly, there are some audiences that just don't care about Tom's journey. Like they're just not interested. So, um, you know, I think that storytelling is a tool that just like any other tool, you need to use it when it's needed. It's not the, the be all fix all that let's tell stories, you know, um, and that's going to fix everything. It, it, it's not right for all audiences at all. So um, the point of what I do and what I'll be talking about today is how you can use stories as a tool, you know, because stories themselves are really just carriers, um, you know, because what you put in it is what matters. We talk a lot about the connection between emotion and storytelling. But what really matters is that you took the time to figure out what emotions you wanted to trigger and how to do that and why you're doing it and then putting it in a story format. Um, because we've all heard stories that do none of that. <laughs> we all heard stories that are like, why is he still talking? Does he know he's still talking? Um, you know, they're not something that are that is um, compelling us to do anything or stirring any feelings of empathy in us. So it's not just the story. It is you finding the content and doing the work. And that's especially true when you're telling someone else's story. It's true for you, too, when you're telling personal stories. But definitely when you're telling someone else's story and as we um, find out that information about the content and the needs assessment, finding out, you know, what's at stake and, and all of that is important, too. So we'll talk about that. All right. Good. OK, so usually the story starts here. It starts in real life. This is I'll say her name is Tasha. So Tasha She's got, look at the design in the back there. That furniture is beautiful. Uh, she loves this store that she shops at and she loves all their merchandise and everything is great, but she cannot stand placing orders. She hates it. And um, one of the reasons why is because it seems like the first level of people that she talks to, they don't know anything. They're always, we're not sure. I don't know. We don't know. And she's like, okay, I have to escalate it every single time. And then they don't know who to talk to. And, and it's just really, really frustrating for her. Right. So this is the story that she's telling herself that every time I call, I'm going to have some sort of battle with customer service and sales to get exactly what I need. The story starts with her. So luckily, management is responsive. They understand this. They've been getting this complaint for years. Finally, there's a new manager of operations and she's like, this has got to change. We're getting all of these um, complaints about um, our first level salespeople not knowing what to do. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create an escalation process. So they create this wonderful escalation process. Um, by the way, this is this format is called swim lanes. I don't know if you've ever seen it before. It's a wonderful way to show how information is handed off or responsibilities are handed off in a um, process. I learned it from a consultant who uh, worked at, was at a bank I worked at. Now, of course, we all got laid off um, after the consultant showed up. But the point is, I love these swim lanes. Okay. All right. So in this, you know, they're handing it off. It's, first, it starts with the customer. Then it goes to the rep. Then it goes to the customer. And it just sort of weaves through this tapestry. And a lot of times as instructional designers, this is where we stop. 
right? We stop right here. We have the content. People don't know how to escalate. And so we're going to create training on how to escalate, right? You hit the star button and you hit two, and then it goes escalate and all of that. This is what I know about meeting any of these people. I know that they know how to escalate. And you know that they know how to escalate. They know how to hit the star too. They know how to escalate. They know they don't know the answer and they should escalate. They know this already. But if you stop here, you won't get to the heart of the matter because at the end of the day, this is what's behind all of that. Real people who have to navigate this process who are thinking, if I escalate this call now, will I get in trouble? Last time I did it, my manager told me, why'd you escalate that? You should have been able to handle it. And when I explained that I couldn't, he got more mad at me, right? Um, maybe it's, what does that say about me? I'm trying to get promoted. I want to be able to handle this, right? My manager's never in the office anyway. Those types of things are the issues at heart here. It's not that they don't know how to hit star two. I guarantee that. There's something else that's going on. And you will only know that if you go behind those boxes and get to the people. The story is in the people. There's a story. Each one of them has a story to tell. And in order for you to get to the heart of what's going on, being able to talk to people at each, each level as much as you can to get their insight, that's where, that's where the performance issue lies. And that's what you're trying to do as a instructional design um, professional. Right. So you're trying to get from that story with Tasha, who's frustrated, to a company that's frustrated and built a new process, who employees who are frustrated um, because they don't know what's expected of them, to this. Right. You're making that journey from real life to screen here. And you're trying to, how can I tell these stories so I can put it into a module so that it makes sense, so that it works? How do I do that, right? So I say it always goes from process to people to product. Process, people to product. What is the process they need to learn? Who are the people who are living this process? That is where the training is, right? And the product is the either the e-learning or the instructor-led course or the job aid or whatever that you're going to give to the people working in that capacity so that they can understand how to do this, okay? So we are always talking about people-centered. People are the center of all of this. And sometimes that's a challenge. So we'll, we'll talk about that. All right, so tell me in the chat, how do you think stories promote learning? Just from what you know, you're here, so you know that there's some connection. You, you believe there's some connection. Some of you know very well <laughs> what those connections are, but let me know in the chat. How? experiences, people can relate to others, becomes relatable. Yeah. Empathy. Yeah. And I think a big one, which is sort of behind what a lot of you are saying is context, right? It, it creates some sort of context around what's happening, whether or not it is a way to promote that context promotes empathy, that this person is just like you in the same situation that you're in, right? So you can feel that connection that someone else mentioned it, mentioned as well, right? It can create this whole experience. You know, at the end of the day, you can say, you want the learner to not walk away with, oh, I just went through training. You want the learner to walk away with, I did that thing. I did that task. I experienced what I'm going to experience on the job as close as you can get there. That's kind of a lofty goal, <laughs> but we try to get there. And, you know, that's about making authentic learning experiences. There's a term high fidelity learning experience that is as close to life as we can get. And because they're going to do this work in a story, get that story and put it in the course as, as closely as you can. So yeah, that all of those things promote learning. We all know that we can't force people to learn, right? Uh, making connections with too familiar. 
Yeah, yeah. I talk a lot about, um, I don't do it, I don't do it in this session, but there's um, a, a lot of work out there about not necessarily learning in, in science and in brain science, but it is about, well, as far as storytelling is concerned, there's a lot about learning in brain science, <laughs> but as far as storytelling is concerned um, and learning and brain science and that intersection right there, but you can infer when they talk about memory, when they talk about um, emotions and the hormones that that can trigger to uh, make something more compelling to them and help them remember it so they can feel triggered and feel like, yeah, this is me. I could definitely relate to that. Right. So it's many, many different ways where it promotes learning. We all know we can't force people to learn. We can't make them do anything. Right. But we certainly can create an environment where learning is both promoted and supported throughout. Right. Um, a, a fellow instructional designer once said to me that it supports everyone's favorite radio station, which is WIIFM. <laughs> What's in it for me? How does this connect to me? People are interested in themselves and creating characters that are living um, a life similar to the people who are taking that course is one way to forge that connection, right? So they say, if you want people to think, give them facts. If you want them to feel, tell a story. And I don't think those things are mutually exclusive, <laughs> to be honest, you could do both. But the general um, idea you know, behind this is if we go look back at the story of the escalating calls, they already have the facts. Maybe some of them don't, but I can create a job aid. I don't need to send them through training, create an e-learning module. If, if it's just them dialing numbers, we can do that. We can put it right on the phone, <laughs> actually. Um, but there's something else going on. There's something else going on. There's something else at stake. Um, you know, maybe it's a new system. Maybe they don't have the resources or other things that are happening there. Um, I had a colleague once tell me something I'll never forget. She said, People don't fear change, they fear loss. And that has that really changed the way I look at the people that I uh, build training for. Because so many times a change comes along and we think, oh, they don't like change, they don't wanna change. Um, but that's simply not true. They're, they're afraid of losing whatever that change means. And an example I use all the time is how when I was coming up in uh, this industry, um, I lived through the whole conversion from uh, mainframe systems to web-based systems. And so you have people who had been working on the same mainframe system using keystrokes, magical keystrokes for decades uh, in this job. And then they get over to this new system. And in my whippersnapper brain, I thought, isn't this great? Don't you want to go to a new system? Look, instead of all these cheat sheets, all you have to do is hit the file menu and do that. Isn't that wonderful? And it never occurred to me that at that time that what, what Helen is losing, she's losing a lot of social capital. She's losing a lot of power because she's the only one with the cheat sheets. She's the only one who knows the quick way of doing something. And if you can easily replace me with this, uh, replace all of that work with this system, what else is going to be replaced, right? So it's that, that feeling behind it of sometimes that's the barrier of why they're not learning, not just that they don't have those facts. It is that attachment to the work they've been doing in fear of losing a part of their identity or part of their routine is what they're afraid of. And trying to take that on in training can go a long way. Okay. So we're going to talk about these four aspects. I sort of devoted, divided up into four ideas here. One is first finding the story. The other one is designing it. And I always say the power is in the people. Develop it, meaning bring it to life, creating a world that people can inhabit and that the learner and the character can inhabit together. And then deliver, which in this case is um, because I'm talking specifically about e-learning, putting a module together and sending it out there or just sort of what some ideas are around that. All right, so let's start with finding the story. 
So I am an external um, consultant. I guess this was true even when I was internal. When I first take a project on who these learners are is like this. It's like this nebulous fog of people. I know they exist, but they're not quite real to me yet. I just know that they exist out there, but I can't see them clearly. But I take your word for it <laughs> that they exist, right? As things become and come more into focus, what I learn is that the story is actually this one person named Michelle. And Michelle is a manager and she has not been assertive enough to communicate with her staff what, they're at, what her expectations are for them. And she came in today and said, no, not today. Today, this is going to change. Today, I'm going to do something different. And this is what I'm going to do, right? That's the story. The story is how she got from being afraid to say what she needed to say to the point where she sat everyone down and said, these are my expectations and this is what needs to happen. So sort of changing that lens from this nebulous blob of people who are learners, learners to Michelle in the story that she's living, uh, you know, that that is the story is with her. It's with her. It's not with learners. It is with Michelle. It is with Kim. It is with Mark. It is with Sammy. It is those people. They have the stories and talking to them makes a big difference or talking to a proxy for them. So always remember these three key, key principles here that the people are the keepers of the story. I always say that if you don't have the story, you have lost the people because it's always a story. We're living in a story. This is a story right now, right <laughs> right now. This is a story. Um, so you, the, but the stories are are within you, right? The story, the people are the keepers of the story. I always talk about the instructional designer having to have 60,000 magical skills. One of those skills is the art of the interview. <laughs> you know, people, journalists go to school for years. They practice for years of how to sit someone down and get the true story. We are left to our own devices of how to figure that out. <laughs> but I say this as well. Every problem that we have in this industry has been solved by another industry. Every problem. There's, we don't have anything brand new that, that we can't go to another industry and learn from. And journalists have that information of how to make people feel comfortable, how to make connections, and how to get them to reveal that information about people. Because it's, it's nerve-wracking. Right. Tell me in the chat. I don't think this comes up later as a question, but tell me in the chat. Why do you think people are nervous about telling their stories to you? And you're just it's just you and them in the room and you're just trying to get insight into why people won't escalate. Why do you think people are, are reluctant to share that information? Mm -hmm. Yeah, vulnerability, fear of judgment. That's a bit that's a that's a big one. You know, they are afraid of what you're going to say and what light you're going to view them in, right? Uh Yeah, they sort of downplay their own the value of their own stories. Who cares? Who cares what I think? Yeah, they don't trust you. You know, especially as a, you know, consultant, I pop up out of nowhere. Like, tell me your whole life and make it interesting. Yeah, it's difficult. Yeah. And all of those are not about facts. You know, they're not about whether they're competent. Those are all emotion, motion driven. And I would say in the number one emotion, the answer is always going to be fear. Fear of something. Fear of something. And us finding ways to break through that. You know, a big way is to say, tell us about someone else. Right. And, you know, I'm asking for a friend, that whole technique. There's lots of different techniques, again, that are out there. Um, the study and the art of interview is helpful. Identify the stakes, the risks and the conflicts that are at stake here. Right. So pick any one of these in the chat and let me know. Why do you think stakes and risk and conflicts are important? Why? Why should I be asking then what if this training never happens? Questions like that. What's at stake here? What do you think? Why do you need that information? How will that help you as you write stories? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the story lives there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I always say that if you can tell me what's at stake, then I can put it at risk in the story. And that's what makes a big story. And it doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be life or death. It could just be loss of respect, loss of time, loss of product, loss of, it doesn't have to be this huge cinematic experience, right? Um, let's see. And yeah, you know, a lot of people, when we talk about story, they really focus on conflict. But I think one thing to keep in mind is the conflict, um, is, it also can be inside of you. <laughs> Right. It doesn't always a lot of people think it has to be another person. That person can be a symbol of that conflict. But so much of it is just our own tur turmoil of what we're going through to try to figure out, should I take this route or take that route? What's lost if I go this way and what's not? So a lot of those conflicts are, are um, can be internal as well. But yeah, so getting that information is what's going to bring the story of light. If not, then it's just a word problem. Sammy has two apples. He gave one away. How many does he have? <laughs> That's a word problem, right? And uh, we want to move away from that and build characters that are at least a little bit more fleshed out. So design, power is in the people. So when I was uh, in high school, because I was super cool, I would come home and watch PBS correspondence courses. All the cool kids were doing it. And one of those courses on PBS was called American Cinema. They don't show them anymore. Um, it used to be on a website called learner.org, but they're not there anymore. So every, um, every uh, maybe that series is, but I don't know. I can't remember. Anyway, so every episode focused on a different genre of film, film noir, the Hollywood musical, things of like that. Um, and they had one, the last one was this round table of, of newer directors. So this was in the eighties. So they're all not new anymore, but newer directors. And I'll never forget, this was in the eighties. I didn't know I'd be doing this for a living, obviously. Um, but one of the directors said something that really stuck out to me. He said, the Hollywood film is always grounded in narrative. And by the Hollywood film, I mean the classic Hollywood film, like Wizard of Oz, um, Gone with the Wind. Philadelphia story, those classic Casablanca films. So the Hollywood film is always grounded in narrative, always grounded in story first, where the story exists and the characters exist, and the characters exist to serve the story to move it along. Right. So the characters are just tools in order to push the narrative forward. And a lot of times when we try to make scenarios or um, you know, that's what we do. Right. We have our content that we know we have to get through, but we just use we just slap a name on these people who are there for the sole purpose to move the story forward. It's not really about them at all. It's about this content that we have to get people through. Right. So that's the sort of the classic Hollywood film strategy for how to build the story is why they had the studio system where they could sort of interchange actors. It, you know, it didn't really matter. What mattered was that this story needed to be told. And he contrasted that with a personal filmmaking, the newer kind, according to him. So that would have been like a taxi driver, you know, Scorsese type of film, um, where the story is a byproduct of the characters meaning that um, the, the characters of the character at the center of the movie is the reason for making that movie. So it is, we're seeing this through the lens of the learner, we are, or the character himself, in our case, the learner, right? Um, and the learner for the prox a proxy for the learner is that main character, right? This is, it's, it's, you know, it's all about what this person is doing and what they're experiencing it and experiencing and what they come across is what we come across as we move through the narrative, right? So if you have something like compliance training, which frustrates a lot of people, they always ask, how can I do a story on compliance training? Well, you're not, you can't, because the story is not compliance. The story is people complying. One example I use all the time is ethics training, where I worked, I worked at BP many moons ago, and we had this ethics training that we had to go through over and over again. And that is not in any way the story. The story is that you are asking me to put the needs of the company above my own, right? 
of me making decisions on should I eat this basket of candy that costs two hundred dollars that a client sent me, which sounds like it's pay for play. Should I pay when I go out to dinner with a client? I would prefer not to. <laughs> so you're I would prefer to eat that chocolate without any questions. But you're asking me to suppress my desire for chocolate to fi to follow the ethics of your guidelines. That's the story of how I try to walk that line and the decisions I have to make in order to do that, what I have to avoid, who I have to talk to, all of that. That's where the story is. It isn't in compliance chapter 5.5.6, where it says, hereby I vow to, like, that's not, that's not a story itself, right? So it's always centered in what those people are doing, right? So we talked about this already. What's challenging about getting, I knew this would show up later. Um, what's challenging about that? And so we talked about that vulnerability, trust, don't know you. Um, I think another thing as well is um, people don't see their lives as stories. And they, and they probably shouldn't see their lives as stories. Um, so when we say, you know, you know, tell me a story about this and Tara, they don't always know exactly what we're driving at, exactly what we mean or how you're going to use this information. Like, how are you going to use it? Right. So, as a, you know, as instructional designers, there's a lot of uh, mystical magic unawareness of what we do anyway um, as a um, as a field that it becomes even more difficult when you're asking to give all asking them to give you all their information and then put it in this mysterious box um, that they don't know what's going to happen anyway right so it, it is a big it is a big ask um, so we can go a long way in making them feel a lot more comfortable with that so the principles here is Always remember whose story you're telling. When I was in graduate school for writing, they would ta taunt us with this all the time. Whose story is this? Whose story is that? And it's not just point of view. It's who do we want the characters, who do we want the learners to sympathize with? And sometimes it's the, it's the company story, to be honest. It just is, right? And that's when you have this content-driven approach. Just be honest about that. Um, but, you know, is it the boss's story? Is it management's story? Or is it really the story of the direct reports? Whose story is it? So, re so remember that. Who is the person through which, uh, whose eyes we should be looking through? Be strategic about how you use that point of view as well. Um, one thing is whether or not you want to have it where um, if it's a, um, a management course, is it going to be this third person where we see a manager and an employee talking to one another, or we're we going to have it where I am the manager and I'm talking to the employee? You know, those are two different approaches that can have a big impact on how people take this learning. You know, the fact that usually we have to can the answers at multiple choice. If you have it where I'm the manager, I may feel like I wouldn't do any of those things. Right? So I may be more open to coaching whoever's on the screen to say, well, those are her three options. This is the best option. So you have to really sort of nuance that because that pl plays a big role in whose story you're going to tell. And that in that character transformation is the story. Always, 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 always. If there's no change, there's no story. There's got to be a change. Right? And I say that mostly for stories that are learning focused, right? Because we want them to make a change and we need to teach them how to make that change and we can do it through story. So change is important. So the story um, is not being at the destination. I think that's an important point because a lot of people will tell stories about how great they are and how interesting they are, but they won't tell us how they got there. That's the story is not telling me about how successful you are. The story is telling me how you got to be that way, because I want to be that way, too. <laughs> I want to do what you did. Um, and we see this a lot in motivational speakers. We see this where they're just like, I'm great. I, I woke up this way um, where we're interested in, you know, wait a minute. What's the journey to that? Because I'm still on this side of the shore. You, you swam all the way across. I want to know how you swam not necessarily how you came out on the other side. I mean, that's great, but that's not really helping me. <laughs> it's not helping me. So the story, since we're focused on change, always remember that it's not being there, 
it's getting there. Mm -hmm. All right. So developing this, bringing it to life. All right. So when you say, for example, you know, you're, you're bringing something to life and you're, you're focused on it, you have this lead, leadership fundamentals class and you have this all developed. One of the issues or one of the problems you may, uh, you know, issues that I have is that you, you've taken this woman, she is there, she's in, she's standing there. However, you didn't do anything to give her an environment that works, right? She is just literally just standing in front of a blue background with a white stripe coming out of her back with your um, bullet points on it. That does not pull us in at all. That doesn't pull us all in. That doesn't engage us. That doesn't do anything, right? So I would argue that instead of doing that, what you wanna do is take this a step further and actually build a whole environment around this person, build a whole environment. And this is nothing, this is just a picture. I mean, this is something that, you know, you just take and blur a little. Um, and if she's working at home, then you you, know, you give her a home environment, but it, it's important. And um, this is e-learning of course, but this the way this can be translated into some sort of instructor led um, environment is just through words and through description. And you can also put imagery in a, in a instructor led course as well whether it's on the slides or it's somewhere else um, or in the workbook or what have you. But I think use of imagery and use of multimedia can go a long way. Let me get a, a sense from you, if you can let me know how many of you do any sort of development. You can give me, just let me know in the chat. How many of you do that? Do any developing, whether it's in, in, do it in instructor or, or however you do it? Hmm. Okay, one of you says yes. So, okay, <laughs> gives me an indication. Um, there's some more one coming in work with articulate storyline. Okay. All right. You know, when you are learning how to do this, for those of you who are experienced, um, you know, this, I know sometimes I see where people are entering the field and learning. And the first thing they do is talk about all these tools. Which tool should I learn? Which tool should you learn? And I always feel like, well, I know for a fact that the tool that you use is step number 635,000, right? Everything you have to do ahead of time is, is far more important and sort of thinking about at the storyboard level, thinking about what tool you're going to use, think about what how you're going to immerse this person into a world and what that world is going to look like is what definitely makes all the difference, makes all the difference there. And so doing that ahead of time before you even think about, I'm going to use this tool or I'm going to use that tool, that's a, that's a big difference there. It's a big difference of really wondering, how can I bring this to life? How can I make this immersive so that people really feel like they're there? They really feel like they're, they're sort of involved in this, in this world. Um, you know, of course, there's that suspension of disbelief you know, where we know that she's not there, but we're going to, we're going to go along with it. So yeah, it, it can definitely, something so small and so simple um, can definitely make a, a big difference if you are telling stories and making characters, whether or not you're doing e-learning or um, instructor led. Right. So I would say that there's the, the principles there is for you to you know create a full world, right? Give them their own voice. Make sure you do that um, if you can. How many of you, for those of you who um, create e-learning, let me know. Do you use voiceover? 
And um, if you do, do you use different voiceover for different characters? For those of you who are, I know, I know the answer is sometimes, but have you um, engaged in voiceover on occasion and use different voices? Let me know, for those of you who do that. I know it's sometimes it's an expense that people don't want to take. I also know that a lot of people do their own voiceover. I would uh, argue, as I often do, and people don't listen to me. <laughs> But, you know, the ability to be audibly picked up on a microphone doesn't make people a voiceover artist. <laughs> you know, voiceover, uh, the ability to do that is a skill. And I have definitely noticed through the years, I used to dabble in voiceover. Um, I used to have Smees do it after. I definitely have noticed when I have demanded that we're going to have, we're going to pay people to do what they do pay people to do what they do, meaning we're going to, I usually up, use Upwork. I find people who for very inexpensively will record voices for you, especially if it's two or three, you know, two or three lines, we'll record those for you and talk about a world of difference between someone who's just talking like a robot, trying his best, bless him, but is not a voiceover actor. <laughs> And the difference of really having people who are, who are really good. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like 10 for 10 finding people with great voice over, doing voiceover um, out there. Um, you know, I would, I would say, you know, invest in it. But again, no one listens. But I do think that uh, give it a try if you have not given a try, even a try, because it does affect the quality when people are just reading and not acting, you know. Um, just like we wouldn't want people to sort of step in and take over and say, I can design training. Anyone can do that. Um, you know, this, the same is true for that. All right. All right, deliver. So we're going to talk a little bit about the structure of the story. Okay. So as I mentioned, the story is, uh, is, getting to the destination, not just being there. And so a lot of times that's how we do this. We focus on the ordinary world and the new world, not in that journey <laughs> in between, because really what it looks like is this, right? So we have Marla here. Marla was a, an employee and she recently got promoted to supervisor. And now all her peers, ex-peers report to her. That's been a tough road for her. Uh, you know, she doesn't feel like she's getting the, the respect from her team that she deserves. That she imagined she would get and she's dealing with it. But then she hires someone of her own and her own budget. And he's quickly adopting the behaviors of her team. And she notices that he is being equally disrespectful. <laughs> so that we have that ordinary world. Now we have this event. This event is when she notices a change in his behavior and realizes that this could go on and on and on if I don't do something, if I don't do something about it, right? So she sort of oscillates back and forth here between, you know, okay, well, I'm going to try this technique. I'm going to try to be nicer. That didn't work. Okay, well, I'm going to try to be more strict. Well, that didn't work, right? I'm going to try to tell people how I feel when well, they kind of ignore that. I'm just going to keep going. I'm going to keep trying these things and going back and forth and just knowing whether or not they failed. And then finally, she reaches this point where she just says, oh, wait, I'm focusing way too much on me and how I feel. I'm not focusing at all on my team and what they're going through. So instead of trying to be the friend that I think they want, I'm going to be the manager that they deserve. Right. So she could just come out and say, hey, I had, you know, that happened to me. I was probably by my peers and I, you know, fixed that. So everything's fine. <laughs> no, that's not that's not the story. I want to know all the things you tried that you remember that you tried that you went through 
in order to get to this point, right? So that's where the story lives. And I have a tool for you that any of you who have dabbled in the theater world may know this tool or have seen it. I know um, Pixar um, has a course on it. I'll show you my, my website. I have some information. They have this free course through Khan Academy called Pixar in a Box. And um, it's called the Story Spine. And it's great because it's an improv tool, right? And it's, I say it's great because it's an improv tool because that means you can memorize it off the top of your head. It's meant to be memorized. Those of many of you have probably heard of the hero's journey. So this is a very condensed version of the hero's journey. And what's nice about this is that it forces you to focus on change, it forces you to think about how people are going to change in this story, right? So you usually set it up with once upon a time. You don't say once upon a time. People ask me that question. Um, you start it off what the world looks like. This is the ordinary world and what is happening in that world. This is important because people won't know the change if you don't give them that world. And then you have that inciting incident. In Tasha's case, it was realizing that the person she hired was being uh, was acting like her ex peers were acting. So that's the crossing the threshold. That's the event that happens through which you will not return the same. Right. So that's an important that's an important step. You can't go back. So what is that? Right. And then you have all these because of that. What I love about because of that is that it is um, it's an incident that occurs because of the incident before it. And this is important because when you're talking to subject matter experts or even we all do it, we begin to sort of waver and, and go on tangents on our stories here. So this forces us to say, OK, well, this event happened. What happened as a direct result of that event? What happened as a direct result of that event? Right. So, um, you know, these are just, you know, what you're trying to do, just like what she was doing, Tasha, going back and forth and changing this and changing that. That's where the because of that's go. Right. And so finally, much like Tasha realized, I can't continue this way. Um, obviously, I'm focusing on all the wrong things. I need to replace my focus. And then the final step is not just what I learned, but how is what I learned going to affect my future behavior? What did I get from that journey? You know, what is the reward that I got that I took back to share with the village? You know, that's the end of the hero's journey. What is that? All right. So it is just a very condensed way of doing it. And I've been telling, I've been using this tool for so long. Now I automatically tell stories like that, just following this pattern. And I use it as a template to just sort of figure out my stories. And then I can nuance them when I pull them out of the template. So here's just a quick example here. Um, say that um, Abby is a supervisor in a um, call center. So set it up here. Abby was reluctant to give feedback to her team because she wanted to avoid conflict. So every day she'd overhear conversations her team had with customers that gave her pause. Some CSRs were rude to customers and would even lie to them. One day she overheard a CSR screaming at a customer. It was so loud that people on the team heard the conversation and looked to Abby to see what she was going to do. This was the threshold. This she has crossed over now to seeing an incident that cannot be ignored, right? Aha, but she tries it anyway. Abby felt pressure to intervene, although she felt uncomfortable doing so. She knew the CSR was already irritated and that their conversation would quickly escalate. Because of that, Abby paused to consider the consequences of intervening and not intervening. She heard the phone call end and the CSR simply moved on to the next call. Okay. And because of that, she sighed and turned back to her desk and relieved it was all over. All right. And so finally, this comes to a head here. The next morning, Abby's manager calls her into his office and reprimanded her because she did nothing to end the escalation. A few people on her team also asked her why she did nothing. So she had to take the heat for the CSR's behavior. So ever since then, Abby realized that doing nothing is doing something. It's making the decision to accept the unacceptable. And her manager and her team are relying on her to lead and her actions and inactions reflect just what type of leader she is. So you can imagine that you are an instructional designer and you go talk to a CSR and you ask them, tell me about a story about when you changed your approach to management. Tell me that story, right? And as they, okay, well, there was a time where I was reluctant 
I didn't used to give feedback, right? Or they could jump to the middle, the end, and you're like, wait, well, what led to that, right? So you can use this almost as an, I use this as an interview template, which I think is on the next slide there, to get these stories out of people. And it helps me remember what I need. I need that change. I need to know how you changed because that's the same change we want the learners to make. And it needs to be in that, in that course. Okay. Now, the caution of storytelling, however, is that it can be very passive. It, like video, there was a time people were so excited about putting videos. I never was that excited because, again, just having a person watch a video is not the most engaging experience that ever happened to them, right? So you think about when can I insert the learner in this, right? So it could be at any point where there's a decision that needs to be made, right? So um, we see after this because of that, a question could be, what do you think the rest of Abby's team thinks about this? What do you think Abby should do next? Or do you think this is a problem? Like you engage the learner at this point. You can ask them again, you know, after um, she paused to reconsider the consequences, you write, what are some of the consequences of her not doing anything, right? This way you can sort of break the story up and break it around. This, this last one here is how do you think Abby can use this lesson in the future? Right. So it's not just this passive. I'm going to tell you a story. There are ways to invite people in to each leg of the story through questions. And so this is an example of just using it as a template. Right. So I just sit down. I can end up with 10 of these and then I have enough fodder to create a story that makes sense based on all these people's experience. Okay. All right, so um, I'll leave you with this. A lot of times people are reluctant to, I say people, I mean stakeholder or subject matter, even the instructional designers, I've heard this before, instructional designers who are reluctant to include stories in their work. And um, a lot of times it's just the word, it's just the word story that they have an issue with. So what I often use instead, instead of story, is high fidelity reimagining of a lived experience. And I know that sounds completely made up, but even for me, when I'm telling it, when I'm writing a story, I like this term because it reminds me that I'm trying to tell an authentic rendering of a lived experience of a person who is actually living this. This is not a made up story. I'm not making up anything, right? I may, I mean, I may add details, but I only have those details because I talk to people, right? So I'm not making up a fairy tale. You know, I am retelling other, other people's lives. And if that's the story, so be it. But the reality is, it, it is. It is a testimony. It is people's lives. All right. Okay. That's what I have. If you go to my um, website and go to resources, there's um, a tab called Story. Um, storytelling resources where you can get some of these templates for um, the story spine and, and other goodies out there as well and other resources too. All right. I am all set. All right. Well, thank you so much, Hadia, for that. Um, next, we did want to provide some additional information about the program, such as curriculum details, application due dates, and admission requirements. So on the next slide, you'll see that the MS in Learning Design and Technology is made up of 10 three-unit courses for a total of 30 academic units to be completed. Um, yeah, could you bump over to the next slide? Yeah. Oh, sure. <laughs> Thank you so much. I was just going to tag that in. So um, like I mentioned, uh, this program is made up of 10 three-unit courses for a total of 30 academic units to be completed. The program is designed to be completed in five consecutive semesters over 20 months. Each semester is 14 weeks long and students will focus on one seven week at a time. And this program is designed with working professionals in mind. So on the next slide, you'll, um, you can take a look at the admission requirements and these of course are listed on our website. So if you have any questions, please feel free to connect with an enrollment advisor and they'll be happy to help you out with any questions you may have. Um, also, when you get the recording, there will be a contact us form that you can use um, or you can visit our website, which I will put in the chat right now. Um, in the application process, our advisors will help you to make sure that you have all of your application materials and then they will personally review them for you. 
And once everything is good to go, they will formally submit the application to Lisa, your academic director. And should you be ex accepted, you will then be enrolled in classes and start your orientation. We do want to call out that spring 2023 semester is approaching, and if you are interested in applying, please note that in order to qualify for our early application incentive, your application will need to be completed and accepted by October 24th. Otherwise, the final application deadline is December 2nd, and the term will begin on January 10th. More information on the early application incentive can be found on our website, and I will put that link in the chat right now. Um, but for this term, if you are accepted by October 24th, you will receive a free blue snowball mic and a book bundle that includes our presenter's book, Story Training, Selecting and Shaping Stories That Connect. Let me put that into the chat really quick. So we wanna thank Hadia again for her presentation. It was wonderful. And then we also wanted to thank Lisa again for joining us. We really hope you enjoyed today's session and please feel free to visit our website to learn more about this program. Um, thank you so much. I hope you all have a great day. Bye. Thanks everyone.